Mark, how's it going, man? What's up, man? I'm hanging in there. How are you? Yeah. How's it going? Well, this is a treat. You've got your uh, got your guitar there and everything. What, uh, man? I, what, what's been going on, man? This last three months, I don't know. I'm I'm hitting an all time low, uh, personally because you know I had like 1,200 concerts scheduled for the summer. I need you to to brighten my day up, man. How the hell's it going? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't look like you're going to any concerts anytime soon. Well noted <laughs> um but yeah i mean it's 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 okay i mean california is not not too terribly bad i mean the hospitals aren't doing too good right now i suppose but uh daily life is somewhat normal i guess um as normal as it can be but there's a vaccine getting ready to be on the way i've been told so oh sooner than later i'm ready i'll stick it in my ass right now um <laughs> yeah what for for you guys though for for i mean this this hits so many bands and i mean any what time there's no touring I, that this just takes a toll but for you guys specifically a band that has had such momentum the last year has been incredible and it, that momentum gets kind of thwarted a little bit D do you use it as a positive to kind of work on new music as you've been doing is that kind of been the positive to take out of this because you guys have really i mean festivals huge festivals uh the ep came out you guys were really ascending how much of a toll has it taken and how much have you used this time to kind of just work on new material? Yeah, it's taken a toll obviously on, um, you know, we're an indie band, right? So like there's no financial, uh, backup, uh, sort of plan, you know, like some record labels obviously have money to support their artists, you know, in times like these and, you know, we're not in that situation really. So that's obviously tough and you got to figure, figure out a way through that part of it. But in terms of spending the day, um, you know, we were supposed to go make a new record in Australia. We obviously couldn't get there. So we sort of hunkered down and worked on the material. We, we were getting ready to record and expanded on that and wrote some more songs. So, you know, ultimately it's going to make a much better record when the time comes to record it. But, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't help. Uh, you're going to have your highs and lows, I guess, throughout this thing, no matter what. Well, you guys are doing your best to, uh, you know, provide a much needed distraction for fans um, coming up here on uh, Friday the 24th. It's locked down at the Viper Room, one of my favorite places to go when I'm in LA. You guys are going to be doing this thing, um, uh, this Viper Room's first ever virtual concert. Talk about kind of how this came about and uh, where people can uh, catch this thing. Yeah, so you can catch it at dirtyhoney.veeps.com. That's V-E-E-P-S. Um, and yeah, we just... You know, we did a, a quarantine session early on um, with the support of Harley Davidson. We did a little thing from the studio and it was really cool. It went really well, but it didn't really capture the live performance that we're really about. The energy, the the personalities of each guy in the band. They were in there, but live uh, concert atmosphere is obviously much different than the studio vibe. So we wanted to do something that was a little bit more energetic and in your face and work with the cinematographers a little bit more on how to, you know, enhance the at home experience, uh, the at home concert experience, um, while also, you know, playing some new music. We have this great new record that we're sort of waiting to record and we've got some new songs we're really stoked about that um, we'd obviously like to share with people in some capacity and, and we thought this might be a good way to do it too. Well, it certainly is. Uh, that That's tremendous. Fans definitely um, head over to um, the website, which is dirtyhoney.com slash veeps. And uh, you can get in there for just nine ninety five. It's a great way to, to, to keep the band, you know, throw some financial support and they're doing all they can for you. And how important is it for you, for you guys specifically to keep this, keep in touch with your fans in this way? Because like I said, that you guys were riding this wave of momentum and this, uh, this virus kind of halted everything for everyone, but for you guys to be able to do something like this, to keep uh, in contact with your fans and to keep them engaged with you guys, how, how important is that for you guys? Yeah, it's, obviously it's super important. Um, you know, we've been trying to do some creative things, whether that's, you know, this event, um, which, you know, obviously we're really excited about. It's gonna be the biggest quarantine event we're probably going to do just because I think we're on we're on the second half of this whole thing being that there's vaccines and stuff in development and, and 
certainly hoping that it ends sooner than later. Um, but we've been doing other things too, like the suitcase sessions to stay engaged with our fans and, and doing, uh, you know, cool location performances. And, you know, I think not only keeping in touch with our fans, but trying to build on what we've already done and, and bring new people that are rock and roll fans into the fold is, is an important, um, part of all this. Cause you don't want obviously the momentum to stop. You want to come out of the other end better, better than you did going in, which I think by having a better record ultimately is the best, uh, the best way to do that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's super important. You got, people are always looking for something, especially now, uh, to entertain themselves with, and, and this will be a good way to do it. Yeah, incredible. I can't wait to, to see this. I mean, to think where you guys have come and some of the stuff you've done. I mean, can you pinpoint a moment or a show that you played? I mean, whether it be opening for Slash or, or Guns N' Roses or The Who, some of the stuff you've done. Is there a moment that you can just pinpoint where you're just like, you know, you couldn't believe that you'd, you'd made it to this point? Or is this just all kind of a part of the natural progression for you guys and just kind of take it, take it as it comes. Um, the who gig was really special. All the gigs, all the opening gigs have been really special. Honestly. I mean, everybody's been so cool to us that yeah, I, I've heard stories, Chris Robinson talking about uh, meeting Greg Allman and he's got a great story from it, even though it wasn't a positive story for, for him at the time, looking back, he really is fond of it uh, now and how it all went down. But, I think uh, all those opening slots were awesome. I mean, I, I literally had an I can't believe this moment when we opened for Guns N' Roses and, uh, you know, I got introduced to, uh, to Axel. And, and obviously by that time, I'd already spent a, a considerable amount of time with Slash opening for him and Miles on the road. But, but meeting Axel was something I never expected to happen. And it happened so it, it, under such weird, random circumstances that, um, you know, I got to spend 30 minutes with Axel just like this, me and him in a room. It was fucking awesome. How, how was it? How was he? What, what did you guys talk about? 30 minutes with Axel. That is yeah, something that's it, a podcast in and of itself. Yeah, I know. Uh, it was cool, man. It was uh, their manager just introduced me to him. And, and it, was, it was an accident that that even happened. I, I, it's a long story. But, um, yeah, just got to chop it up with Axel about – Breaking Bad and the Sopranos and what it's like being on tour again and playing with Guns N' Roses again and uh, he had slipped the night before on stage and he was um, very self-deprecating and had a good uh, good sense of humor about that certainly um, so it was really cool man he couldn't have been nicer to me honestly I, you hear different things about him and he was very very gracious with me and with his time well I mean I know that uh, it's been crazy. You guys had a lot of shows that you were hoping to play and a lot of things, but what has kind of hit you personally harder, the lack of touring or the lack of hockey? I know you're a hockey guy, almost yeah. pro yourself. What has what, it been like with no hockey? There was a moment there where uh, <laughs> I was watching hockey as all this was sort of starting, and I was like, please don't take this away from me. I can get through it if I have the playoffs, but uh, – yeah, that's been tough. Um, I'm a big hockey fan. Like usually in the back of the, the bus or the van, whatever, I'm I'm watching hockey if we're on a travel day, uh, you know, from, from 4 o'clock Pacific time into 10 o'clock at night. So, um, you know, that's still a big part of my life. Playing is still a big part of my life. And that came back for a second, which was a nice outlet for me back into normal life. And, and it's since been taken away again, unfortunately. But uh, – uh yeah, touring obviously would be the bigger uh hit that's that's my life that's what i ultimately love and, and want to do and um there's nothing like stepping on a stage um in my book well this kind of you know your journey takes you back to the fact that you were raised in new york in upstate new york um mm -hmm. talk about that kind of your upbringing i mean you as, as far as i understand it were studying music from the time you were a kid i mean is this just something that one of those stories that you hear where people say, I knew what I wanted to do for when I was little. And that's kind of the path that was laid for you. I mean, is that, is it as simple as that for you or kind of some deviations along the way? I mean, obviously yeah, I, almost I, becoming a pro hockey player. There's that. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I never was anywhere close to becoming a pro uh, hockey player, unfortunately. Uh, though I, I did want to do that at one point, but I, um, 
I never had like any formal like training or study with music. I just always was a fan of rock and roll from Aerosmith and ACDC and Zeppelin and the Stones. And, uh, you know, later on discovered artists like Pearl Jam and Soundgarden, Audio Slave, Chris Cornell, Nirvana, the Black Crows. Um, and, and just sort of always was singing along to those records. And that's, that was just a weird thing I had, you know, I was like, Oh, Mark can really belt the high note to dream on or whatever. And, um, I never really took it seriously until, uh, until I moved to LA and really wanted to make it a career. Um, but played lacrosse in college and played a lot of sports growing up, played guitar and had a lot of different interests, but ultimately music was my, my calling. Well, tell your LA story because, um, just kind of in the, the brief time that I think we, we had you on about a year ago and um, got to just a little of it. And just in reading about you guys and about you, it seems like you kind of have that typical move to LA, nowhere to live, homeless, just trying to figure it out. I mean, you see, you got, that's kind of a story you hear so frequently. Is, is that kind of how it was for you? And kind of how did you ever get out of that sort of realm and start, started to, you know, get above water, so to speak? Yeah. Um, yeah, I lived in my car um, for a little less than a year uh, after having a great place. I, my first place in LA, I moved in with a friend who, who uh, graduated college and, and had a great place like right on the beach. And um, when that ended, because he was moving back home, I just moved in with somebody else that didn't work out and wound up in my car for about a year. And um you know, thanks to the support of some really good friends. I, I graduated uh, after that to a porch in West Hollywood, lived on the porch for a little while. And, um, you know, just started, started to get my life together, um, both financially and professionally as a musician. Started, you know, booking gigs around town, had a buddy really push me into music and, and, and really like help connect me with other musicians that were like-minded wanted to be in a band were rock and roll um could could do this for little or no money at the beginning um because that's a tough those are tough characters to find in la when there's so much opportunity to be a paid sideman so um yeah once i met john Nato, we were kind of off and running as as in finding other members you know do you feel like you're somebody that kind of from a young age, maybe you knew that maybe not what you wanted to do, but the fact that you maybe weren't suited for just a normal life. I find those type of oh, people fascinating. Yeah. I'm kind of one of those. Yeah. I'm kind of one of those two that it's like, as a kid, I didn't know what I was like, I liked pro wrestling and sports and love music. I don't know what you do. Like I not, I'm not, uh, you know, athletic enough to play football, but I, yeah. maybe I could like cover it. Maybe, okay. So there's that. So you find that path. And for you, do you, so you feel the same, like you just like, okay, life, kids like white picket fence and uh, factory job not for me you knew that early on that's not for me right. I, I definitely remember going home I was working on the show uh, Sons of Anarchy uh, at the time and I remember going home over the holidays and like you know that was a huge TV show and, and a lot of people loved it and I loved it too it was my favorite show at the time and I was working on my favorite TV show in LA like that is in and of itself a dream job for a lot of people and I remember being on set and just kind of being bored and not wanting to be there. It felt like it was in the way of me making music. And um, I remember going home and family would be like, wow, what's it like if you're out in Sons of America? I was like, honestly, it's pretty boring. I'm just <laughs> sitting around all day, you know? And uh, that was kind of a telltale sign for me. Like, I'm not, I'm not cut out for this sort of, these 12 hour days on a film set sitting around doing nothing isn't really interesting to me. And it, it, it didn't seem all that interesting to the actors either. Um, whether or not it was, I don't know, hmm. but uh, you know, they weren't really too hyped on sitting around all day at a deli, like in Eagle rock um, sweating their balls off, you know, out in the hot sun <laughs> in the of summer, like it, which just wasn't, uh, I don't know. But it was a great show. I had a great time on the show. I have a lot of great friends from that period of my life that really introduced me to my love of motorcycles. And, um, you know, there was a lot of good that came out of it. It just really made me realize I don't want to be doing this for the rest of my life. 
Wow. So something even as cool as working on the set of Sons of Anarchy, one of my favorite shows of all time as well, didn't quite quench that thirst for you. That's that. No, it's awesome though. Like you knew, like you had a vision. That's awesome. Yeah. And you know, it's great money. Like you can, you can earn a really comfortable living doing it. Um, you know, you're not going to be rich, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but, um, it's just, uh, making a TV show is a massive collaborative effort between hundreds of people. And, you know, in that sense, it's really cool, but I wasn't really in a creative position at all with the show. I was kind of, you know, one of the militia, so to speak. So, um, you know, and I had deep aspirations and I, I still worked even when I was, uh, after the EP had come out, I, I worked hard right up until the day we, we officially went on tour. And that was like my last day on set. And, um, I remember my buddy who I'm still good friends with. I, I worked with him every day. He was a musician in Seattle back in his day. And, and he'd be walking me around, you know, on set and be like, this guy's gonna be a rock star. Uh, he's going on tour slash tomorrow. It's his last day. See you later. And like everybody was really proud and happy for me. So that was cool. Um, but I, I don't have any intention of going back to that line of work. Well, you got, for you guys, I mean, it's one of those things where I feel like no pressure at all, but people throw around terms like dirty honey is, um, <laughs> you know, a, a savior type band, a transcendent type band for rock music. Uh, you kind of heard that about Greta Van Fleet, a couple, uh, Greta Van Fleet, a couple years ago. Um, I feel like that's something that gets thrown around about Dirty Honey. Uh, that's no pressure at all. But this next record, with that kind of expectation and with that that sort of attitude about you guys, I, I mean, I'm, American rock and roll has been searching for a band like you guys for so long. This next record, it's really important for you guys. That's an understatement, right? I mean, it's it's huge. Yeah. It's everything. Yeah, it is, and. And, you know, I've been asked um, recently, like, are you feeling a lot of pressure with this record coming up? And had you asked me back in March when the pressure was really on, like we were going into the studio maybe with the goal to come out with like another five songs or something. Uh, I think that's where we were pretty much resting our head on. We were going to do like another five, maybe six. And now, uh, you know, and the pressure was on because I knew we had like, yeah, we had a couple really good ones, but we we have a pretty high bar to meet uh, already. And now with with quarantine giving us some time to continue working and to work on on more stuff and create more stuff, uh, the pressure has sort of taken this turn into being excitement. Now I'm excited to get into the studio because I'm confident about where we're at, and you know we just have more ideas and more really good ideas. And there's some riffs that I think are just going to go down some really classic riffs um for rock and roll in the next near future so uh it's exciting for us now well mark um absolutely cannot wait and uh hopefully we start getting things back to some level of normalcy here at some point and we get you guys back on the road and get you this record uh, done properly cannot thank you enough for hopping on with this man it's been a pleasure watching you guys grow and um everything that's happened since the ep to now you guys are really on a collision course i think for greatness so can't wait to see what happens from here man thank really you. appreciate it thank you yeah i appreciate the time and uh stay safe stay healthy keep it dirty always my friend thanks mark <laughs>